I hope, I hope everyone had the opportunity to step away and uh, get something to eat, feel re-energized and reinvigorated for the next uh, portion of our day. I'm going slow just to allow people to get settled in. Um, so we have a couple more uh, sub discussions on the gathering spaces. We just talked about the indoor uh, gathering spaces and we are now, oh, sorry, we talked about the outdoor gathering spaces and we're now going to move into the um, thinking about indoor spaces for gathering. So this is really around if we want this building or if the STLC next wants this um, center to be inviting and welcoming space for the community members and for um, everyone to feel that they can access the space and belong in the space and they have a sense of shared ownership. Um, this is really the intention of this discussion. And I think Leslie is going to um, maybe provide us a little context. Yeah, if you don't mind, thanks so much, Leslie, too. <laughs> um, I just wanted to remind people because it's come up uh, periodically today that in the test fit building program there well one of the big things that led the test fit was to quadruple the size of indoor gathering spaces because right now the building for the last 50 years has been closed except when there's a performance on for two hours every night so the idea that it's going to be open and transparent to the public accessible to anyone at any time is really important thing to remember. The building is completely shifting its focus from thinking of it as a place that you go and pay a ticket to, to a place you go because you need to be there for your own purposes, whatever that might be. So that's really, really important. Um, there is food, <laughs> and I'll just say the word food, that is planned. Um, you can call it a cafe, you can call it a restaurant, you can call it a commercial kitchen. The fact of the matter is there absolutely will be food and drink available at any given floor at any given time, whether that's um, a place that you bring your own lunch or maybe some a place that you buy something or you might come to an event or you might you know use the concession if you're at the theater. but the fact of the matter is food is a huge piece of this al already and I know that it's not going to go away in terms of the design. So in terms of the, the gathering spaces um, inside and obviously out, um, I would say food is a must, it's a given, and if you have any ideas around what that means that's great, but other than that it's completely up to interpretation and how people will gather whether you're with one or a hundred. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. That's a great um, perspective to start us on this journey of discussing this indoor welcoming space. And um, to your point around the, the test, uh, I am showing that currently on my screen so people can see the, the current kind of vision of what, what that does that mean from an indoor gathering space. So you can see there's a living room that, that kind of hugs the front street um, or is parallel to Front Street and moves into the interior uh, in an L shape or in a reverse L shape or hockey stick shape maybe. And then uh, Scott Street living room uh, kind of along the Scott Street side there. So when that might help to help us when we're thinking about what can we do or what ideas might we bring forward to help um, the design who designer who takes this challenge on um, bring forward ideas for the City of Toronto for Toronto Live to um, develop this amazing space. So um, I just was, wanted to show that briefly before I get back onto the question slide, which is really around, you know, how do we envision developing an inclusive, safe, and inviting public space that encourages gathering indoors? So. I think you should be now seeing the presentation slide. If you want me to put the design test slide up at all, just let me know and I'll flip back to it if you want to have another look at it. Um, so 
I think we ended our last discussion with Haley Ray and making some incredible points around accessibility. And how do we feel about maybe starting this discussion with Haley Ray? Do you feel okay about that? Okay, I think I see a nod. And so I'm gonna invite Haley Ray to, to open us up on this. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I think I'd begin here, uh, you know, ensuring that the main entrance is accessible, um, uh, starting that visit from an accessible entry point, um, ensuring that uh, service counters and perhaps any waiting areas or fixed queuing guides are accessible. Um, one thing to note is um, in the design of public spaces, uh, being a part of the AODA, is um, those sort of three elements, service counter, waiting areas, fixed queuing guides, are, are really the extent of the design of public spaces um, related to the um, interior, and that the requirements that go along with those are, are quite qualitative. So it's important that we're distinguishing what those quantitative um, uh, requirements are related to each of those, just to ensure that the accessibility of those spaces are upheld. Um, in addition to that, thinking about accessible signage and wayfinding to allow for independent navigation. Um, we've discussed various sort of multimodal ways of wayfinding, so be it um, the integration of uh, tactile direction indicators um, to sort of key um, uh, spaces within, within the built environment. Um, typically, you may see it from the uh, main accessible entrance to the service counter to perhaps the closest uh, public use accessible washroom um, to the elevators, <clears throat> excuse me, et cetera. Um, and again, the maintenance of any of these accessible elements. Um, I'm glad that um, Leslie uh, shared just the, the clarifier of the food being a part of the um, programming because I had food services question mark. Um, so that's wonderful to note. Um, again, the, the access from both the public side and the staff side of those spaces um, to ensure that um, persons with disabilities really emphasizing persons with perhaps physical disabilities um, can engage in both sides of that transaction point. Um, and then maybe this is less related to the built environment, but the idea of cultural inclusivity, which I think is a point that we've talked about, um, thinking about how that might be integrated into the actual food that is served at the place, I think could be really powerful. Um, and then as well, any sort of um, decor or art that is throughout the space, ensuring that those visualizations are as inclusive as possible, representing a diversity of people. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for opening things up. I think it's a, you, you really do add such a great perspective. And so we can take those and, and start to build on them with our different uh, viewpoints for the collaborators here. And perhaps we can take it from um, that indoor accessibility point of view to thinking about fenestration and windows. Um, Dave, would you like to, to talk about that a little bit when we think about the indoor? Sure. Um, so here again, I think that in terms of the, um, the vision glazing component of the facade, I mean, I think this is this connectivity to the outside through views, through daylight, um, ensuring that we have you know proper color rendering um, based on glazing technology, so we can balance those things in. And so we're harvesting sort of the natural components that we want. We're looking to maybe selectively um, reject some of the things we don't want, like glare, which certainly creates some challenges um, for occupants in that space. So from those component uh, areas, from that sort of um, human height aspect of the interior, I think those make sense. Um, again, here is bringing in sort of diffuse natural light above, um, you know, um, that human space and, and sort of using that as, as well to inform sort of just how we move around that space, how we feel in that space as occupants, how we can reduce energy um, as well, I think, um, are sort of interesting things uh, to consider. Um, the you know, the way this, this building is working, I think, is, is a 24-7 kind of concept is we really have to sort of maybe delineate this further and look at sort of the daytime uses versus nighttime uses and maybe see how those interact what the differences are what some similarities are um, and, and that's a pretty expansive question right now I think there's just so many different aspects to this um, so you know maybe somebody else wants to pick this up but from that perspective at least you know looking at sort of the connectivity through 
vision gloss diffuse glazing i think there's some components there that certainly um you know create not just um safety but but also sort of really sort of inform that space and how it might be used Thanks so much, Dave. I think maybe, um, Leslie, if, are you still online? If you are, you, it might be good to hear your thoughts on the delineation between the daytime use and nighttime use. I think it's a great point that we could explore further. I'm so entirely it's... sure how, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question because maybe I, um, if you could, Dave, if you could prompt me a little bit in terms of, are you talking about activity? Activity, certainly, but maybe just are there are there different groups of people that we would see more in the evenings or nighttime than we would during the daylight hours? Um, you know, what are we doing internally with with you know, some of the curated spaces during those times, are they going to all be open or some open, some closed? Because I think that really sort of informs also what, what we might need to do with some of the systems and, and, um, and the interactions of those systems. I want to make a joke about vampires are usually come out at night, but um, I, I think that the, the, uh, the idea is that, because as I, as, I, as I said, the building is not used at all during the day and we've got like the heating and cooling going on <laughs> and it's it's really uh quite wasteful and so if we were to open up the building and it was more available and very available for that matter during the day and i usually use the analogy like a library so you have people actually using these public spaces during the day that makes a big difference i think the performance times you know, they may shift a little bit, but I think there's more of a convention that will continue to be more in the evening, maybe some matinees, but I think that's where you're going to see greater number of people coming through the building because of when the performance spaces or event spaces are being used. But the the gathering spaces, I would say, are they, they could be very populated um during the day and when i say 24 7 i know this is a terminology we all bat around but i i think between midnight and seven in the morning it's going to be um relatively inactive let's say unless we did something like a nuit blanche where you've got really a 24-hour kind of festival happening does that answer your question yeah okay that's very helpful thank, thank you very much leslie so, um, Dave, with that insight, is there anything that you'd like to um, add to the comments that you've already provided to us? Um, no, I think you know maybe that just again creates a nice level playing field for the rest of the uh, the team to weigh in on. And I'm sure that you know from an interior perspective, I know Haley Ray always talks about wayfinding and sort of connecting with colors and details. And, and you know these are all really important considerations to make sure that anybody in this space can I think you know who's not maybe used to this space or hasn't been in there before can easily access all the key components but that's certainly not my area of expertise to uh, to discuss thanks so much Dave and, and I think that for the purpose of our collaboration here don't feel limited to only talk about your area of expertise expertise I think it's great to share your lived experiences as well as your areas of expertise um, so I do want to make sure that that's clear for everyone. Um, now I'm kind of thinking, who do we go to next? We talked about accessibility. We looked at you know the the visual um, uh, connection between the street and the indoors. I wonder if maybe it makes sense now to go to Nicole and and think about the opaque um, connection with the exterior. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that this ties into what I was saying earlier about having spaces that are flexible to be either inside or outside spaces by um, continuing that uh, opaque enclosure into interior spaces, which can then be um, opened up to the outside. And I think that in terms of, you know, specifically the opaque enclosure and how that um, ties into this, I think that that's really the the main item to consider, but um, outside of that, outside of my um, you know, work 
expertise hat. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking when we started talking about this interior gathering spaces and the discussion of, um, you know, food definitely being one aspect that that's available uh, is the potential for maybe like pop up restaurants, um, <clears throat> which I expect would impact uh, the way the space is laid out, right? It, it, to be designed to be flexible for different kinds of um, different kinds of cuisine and different kinds of uh, chefs who may who who may want to use that space, um, and that gives, I mean, it potent. <clears throat> it's great to do that for you know chefs that people know and and will draw a big crowd, but it's also a potential um, for kind of lesser known new and upcoming chefs and uh, that can then, you know, put their form of art out for people to come. And uh, if they can't, for whatever reason, have a, you know, open a restaurant, they, they could maybe do a residency. Mm. These are great ideas. And, you know, you're triggering some responses on the chat. So we have Mike saying, yeah, the restaurant bar could be a destination in and of itself, thinking like the Opera Sydney House, or Sydney Opera House, mm -hmm. right? And Leslie chimed in to say, yeah, create a theater kitchen. Who is art, says Bettina, culinary art. Okay, so we're getting <laughs> excited about this idea of, of being um, adaptive and flexible with food. And I think uh, also building on what Haley Ray said is that it's that cultural consideration too, that there could be different offerings. Um, so pop, mm -hmm. yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. I wonder if um, uh, maybe I can probe a little further on the flexible opaque enclosure. So I was going to probe further on this when we talk about the blurred lines on the next discussion area, but yeah. because we just mentioned it now, it feels like a good time to explore that a little bit further because I'm not sure that that is clear to everyone. What do you mean when you say that the opaque enclosure is flexible to allow for some indoor outdoor space area? Uh, yeah, so when um, I'm trying to think of a, a building that I could use as an example, and it's kind of difficult because most buildings you walk in and it's all open, you know, on the main floor, but um, to have the ability to, if you, for example, walk into the the lobby, you know, the, which will be public space, um, you walk in through the doors, and then there are, you know, there's going to be interior walls that separate that from something else, right? That's that's beyond that. Um, so the idea would be that. Um, if that you know lobby entrance space, which you know maybe it has a a seating area and it has whatever else it might have in it, um, if you designed those interior walls that separate that kind of first landing space from additional space in the building, if you designed those walls as if they were exterior walls, then you could potentially open up that what what is you know but for most of the time is the exterior wall and that space then is open to the outside. So you're expanding your outdoor space, um, but it again, gives you that flexibility to use the space as one or the other, um, which like I said, would definitely, you know, you'd have to look at how that gets shut off from the mechanical system in that case. Um, and it, it really that, building those enclosure walls and shutting it off from the mechanical system allow you to use it outside of conditions where the inside and outside environmental conditions are similar in the shoulder season. So it allows you um, to be able to have that expanded outdoor space, you know, when it's hotter in the summer or colder in the winter without, um, you know, wasting energy from from inside, it allows you to to still keep that building, separate it from the dissimilar outside environment. Um, because we don't only gather outside when it's 21 degrees. You know, we we still gather outside when it's 30 or 35, and we still gather outside when it's minus 10. Um, so it's it's uh, yeah, it's about building some of those interior walls as if they were outside walls, so that you can. Mm -hmm turn them into outside walls sometimes. 
It's, yeah, it's amazing. So you're really integrating that indoor space with the outdoor so that you have your almost exterior walls inside that indoor outdoor space or you know, right. more in the so interior. So you have kind of two, two exterior walls um, from, so that you can change kind of where that building line is. And yeah, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a challenge, right? Because you're, you're building two enclosures and you're, um, you know, assuming that you have space above, you're, you've got now soffits that you have to make sure are separated um, with, with a thermal control and, and vapor control and all that kind of stuff. And you've got walls and you've got the tie-ins and you've got to have the mechanical independence from, from one space to the other so that you can turn on or off that space that is sometimes outdoors. Like it's, it's definitely challenging um but it doesn't use any kind of new technology it's not like we're using the you know cutting edge technology it would you would do it with all the things that we are used to using when we build buildings Mm -hmm. um it's just taking into account that extra layer of um variability in how that space can be used and making sure that all of the systems take that into account. But I mean, it's not, yeah, it's, it's, there's nothing, there's no new technology that would go into it. It would just be making sure that the existing technology is appropriately uh, put together. It's, it's a really interesting idea, I think, and I'm glad I appreciate you unpacking it for us further. Thanks so much. And then I do think that when we, when we marry that or couple that up with this idea of um, pop-up kitchens and and changeable food service, and I see Miles was talking about, you know, having mini kitchens that you could have a cult, a halal or a kosher kitchen or, you know, different cultural kitchens as as, uh, Haley Ray mentioned and pop-up kitchens, all this idea around food, everyone gets excited about the food, but imagine those food pop-ups and then having no walls, like where walls normally are and how that would bring people uh, really into the indoor space. I think that's a it's a very interesting uh, combined or integratable concept. Um, so thanks so much for for letting me pause on that. And when I, we get to the blurring of lines, I probably may mention it. We don't need to go into details of what it means anymore because you've done that for us so far. But then I think about okay, so how do we manage the uh, the the integrating that with the HVAC system? And and uh, that makes me wonder what Kara has to say. Zoning, 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 um, and keeping gas out of the kitchen. So the less gas you have, uh, less indoor pollutants. So the lower the kitchen exhaust rate need to be, but just lots of dampers that are automatically hooked up to the occupancy sensors and the lights. So if you're in that bit of the kitchen zone, then you can turn it on. Um, I think there's this whole piece about educating people how to use uh, zero carbon cooking and demonstrating that it's possible. Um, Right now, when I try to point people to examples, I uh, say there's a net zero McDonald's in um, Disneyland, and they promised that they would publish their equipment list, then never did. And that's what I've got right now for zero carbon, like gas-free kitchens. So there's really an opportunity in Toronto for demonstration of ways that works. David, I think you and Devin had an example, right? Yeah, that's right. Actually, Devin, if if you're there, you know, feel free. Um, I don't know if he's still on. I don't mind either way. I am here. Um, yeah, I go was, ahead. Go ahead. We, tell, tell them about Scarborough. Uh, yeah, exactly. So we were out at the uh, new um, passive house uh, student residence that U of T Scarborough is just wrapping up the construction of, uh, and they've actually gone with an all electric kitchen. So that's going to be a great example to point at in, um, you know, in the city. Um, the other thing with that, I think, is that during their research into what they could do, U of T compiled a bunch of information, and I'm sure they're willing to share this. So we were actually talking about how they might be able to share that through our uh, Green Will initiative or something, you know, put together some documentation on that. So I think that's... Uh, you know, extremely laudable. I'd also point back to, um, I remember when I was doing consulting, you know, it's a 10 or 15 year old study uh, out of Sweden on energy use in all electric kitchens. So I'm sure we could dig that up, but uh, you know, another um, 
fairly detailed example of the equipment that uh, that went into that kitchen. Yeah, and yeah. To, add, to add to that, um, uh, they said the lesson learned there so far from U of T is uh, early engagement with whomever is going to be using those commercial facilities is key. And I think somebody, somebody mentioned education. I think the learning curve can be steep or the assumption is that you need gas to cook, right? So I think it's really important to get ahead of that. And uh, what was particularly interesting is that it was a U of T staff that actually went out and basically spoke to providers and, and whomever they could to get that information. Like for example, an electric pizza oven, very rare. They had to go out and 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 find out who can provide that. and and. Uh, you know, this is a commercial kitchen in Scarborough. It's going to be doing like, what was, I think they said 2000 meals a day. So this is a, like, you know, this is a significant undertaking. Uh, you know, it's a 700 bed student residence. It's a lot of food. So uh, this is like going to be, I think, a, probably one of the best examples we'll have soon uh, in the city. Yeah, to totally agree. Good, good ad. Um, you know, I'm hoping to see something smaller as well. So. You know, it's been something we've discussed through our programs with uh, a, a few restaurants who are looking to retrofit, but um, nothing yet on that side. Well, and I think that the difference between this and that Scarborough facility is the idea that you could let a restaurateur in here for a weekend to play with it and like really figure out how the equipment worked before they committed to buying it themselves. Mm -hmm. Love that right, idea. So being a test kitchen, that is so cool. Um, I'm monitoring the uh, the chats and please make a point of, of monitoring it. and adding. I love that we're hearing from Brianna and uh, Hakan and Miles and, and everyone. Please feel free to continue adding to the chat. When there's a chat uh, point that might be talked about later, Kara, I will bring it up when we talk about uh, sustainability because uh, that might be a great uh, HSC3 uh, comment to include later. Um, so thanks so much for adding to the chat and then I. I appreciate this test, test kitchen option and then we're looking at case studies. I think that helps people to come along the, the knowledge journey. Um, so I wanted to, as we're moving, how do you feel, uh, Devin and, and David and McMillan, just on this idea of having that movable exterior wall? So you have two exterior walls, one that's actually more in, inside the building that allows for that exterior wall to be moved um, uh, to allow for shoulder season usage. I mean, just so my, my initial gut instinct is that's going to be a difficult, um, you know, feature to especially ensure is airtight uh, mm -hmm. consistently and has a good level of insulation. You know, that, that being said, it's always good to explore things like that and look at what, um, you know, the cost might be and, uh, you know, what expected maintenance as well and if it fits into the project. You know, I love that kind of space and um, you know how it could potentially be used but i know it is an absolute nightmare from a building envelope perspective yeah that's a good I, oh. oh sorry lizzie yeah please go ahead i uh i may not be you know picturing it exactly as was intended but uh it maybe it's worth saying as well that at the same building at uft scarborough their loading area, which is open to the outside, it will have garage doors, is actually outside of the building envelope. It was really difficult to do that, but you can create sort of partially out, quasi outdoor spaces. Uh, it takes a lot of work to get it right, but it's doable. And uh, I think if that's kind of the intent, uh, you know, I think if, like to, to Devin's point, uh, the details will really matter, but you can have that. It's just like, then you need, you know, certain kinds of doors, right? Garage doors that are, you know, designed for, you know, very high levels of thermal performance and our tightness. But I, I think it's a performance space. We have to push the envelope, so to speak, in some domains here, right? Thank you for yeah. weighing in. Oh, and I mean, on that ahead. point, I was just going to say that it's um, like in colder climates like Calgary and, and up north, it's very common for the vestibules to be built as that kind of, um, buffer space where the enclosure actually continues into the vestibules and the interior doors are also um, like exterior rated doors and the walls within the vestibule are are all designed as exterior walls so it is something that is is done um, but like David said it's 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 challenging detailing um, 
then I mean, in those colder climates, it's mostly because otherwise your doors end up covered in ice um, because of condensation. But uh, definitely something that I think expertise can be pulled from, you know, colder climates, even though the the reason behind doing it is a little bit different. Um, the way it's executed is going to be very similar. Mm. Such a great point. And I think, uh, Kara, you make a great one as well in the chat function is, is, is uh, this is such a high prominence enough, uh, it's a high prominence project, enough so that a design composition that rewards the airtight commercial movable glazed wall could be an idea to include in the RFP if that's something that your, um, you know, designers might consider. Uh, yeah, or might... not even, yeah, not in this architectural RFP, but as a separate thing, right? The City of Toronto, oh has in its commercial real estate portfolio just in your head think of all the restaurants you know that have a big glazed wall at the front that they like to open in the summer and close in the winter now if we had a product a real product that was manufactured in ontario that we could retrofit those with that gives us a solid performance it's a huge gap in in what's available for designers right now so you know a design competition to fill that I think the reason it doesn't exist is that people don't believe that we need it enough. It's not because it's you know technically impossible. So the challenge is that people do think that they want it. They'll pay exorbitant fees for this. Look at residential part nine buildings where we have, and I've done movable wall systems or movable glazed facades in, in these designs up to 54 feet wide. They are absolutely horrible in terms of air tightness, water test pressure um detailing they are inefficient at best and they are stupidly expensive and so the reality is i agree with kara there is no viable product in my opinion in the market today anywhere forget north america forget anywhere else these don't exist um mm -hmm. so sometimes you know these things as much as they, they they look great in a magazine um are very very difficult to make real and especially if you're looking at maintenance intensivity if you're looking at downstream costs um you know this is a money pit that will continue to, to be drawing in funds for decades until you decide to replace it, typically with a fixed facade or a fixed glazing component. So at this point, I, I'm not sure if, if, if it's if it's not low-hanging fruit in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe um, more of a, a, like to Kara's point, the city could do a design composition to come up with a, a solution that would be feasible in the future, but currently this is perhaps a more of a, but I think that's perhaps a, we can put a pin in it and we've taken the notes in terms of the idea of it and then the practicality of it can be something that um, through the exploration of what works uh, for the city, they could come up with. And Dave McMillan, are you wanting to chime in here? Yeah, just before I, I forget uh, on the subject of sort of some of these uh, mechanical sustainability related discussions, uh, when we talk about safety, I think like the arts sector was absolutely devastated during COVID, right? And I think the space has to be designed to allow people still to gather when there may be an, uh, an airborne virus or what have you. Um, and Because it can be, uh, you know, obviously there will still be public health rules to follow, but I think it shouldn't be just all or nothing. Like, I think there are ways that we can design spaces to still be gatherable in spite of this. And it's not just for where the public gathers, but like my sister had to, you know, uh, lip sync to her own vocals at one point in a room separate from people, you know, like it got really weird during COVID, right? So the point is it's throughout the building that I think you want to allow it still to be used given that, I mean, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it's going away and the odds are there will be others to deal with in the future. So future-proofing it for that, I think is important. Yeah, great point, Dave. I think, uh, I mean, we'll definitely make note of it in the in the report for you in terms of these ideas. And I think it's a great point to consider that these, um, the, the pandemic that we face, it's maybe something that we'll see again in different types of pandemics coming forward. So that has been a long-standing understanding with climate change and, and environmental um, science community that these, these Lines are getting blurred and things are evolving beyond, uh, you know, in a lightning speed kind of real life situation. Um, thank you for the great points. I feel that kind of, it might be good to, so now we've looked at it from a mechanics perspective. I want to land eventually on the indoor air, air environmental quality perspective, but I thought before we do that, 
one of the questions here that we're that we're talking about is how do we find this way to incorporate more of the outdoor space indoors to allow for that flexibility you know when we can't be or when we we're limited by pandemic or when there's other things that are happening and so i wanted to ask sebastian or Seba, how are we going to do this from an energy performance standpoint like what do you think zoning 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 as Kara said. <laughs> zoning, zoning zoning okay I mean, if we're looking at, at, at spaces that are highly flexible with occupancies that oscillate from empty to fully loaded. And I think the key from an energy or performance perspective is, is having systems that, that are as flexible as the uses, uh, having compartment or having systems that are specifically designed for those areas and that are designed not to um, not to be optimal at the maximum capacity, but to be optimal in that middle ground. And if you if we look at how systems typically are designed these days, we look at worst case conditions and that's what we assign to, but the reality is buildings don't operate in that more than 10 to 12, 20, 200 hours a year. And it's a, it's, it's a missed opportunity from a performance perspective uh, to focus on those worst case conditions. So uh, from an energy perspective, um, zoning things properly, delineating systems that respond, that are good at responding at, at, at variable um, occupancies is really important. Time it to controls like um, lighting controls, demand control ventilation, um, and as, as they were saying, still provide the ability to go for, let's say, 100% outside air in situations where it's needed, but let's really design for the the amount of time we spend in normal condition from a weather conditions at least and and i think that's the shift that we're starting to see in high performing buildings is is the need to think not only what's the worst case condition um but really what what we typically see in the building um we'll talk about this later but the idea of designing to the future and we we've seen in the chat a lot around um how this kitchens and how the concept of a kitchen is evolving and, and ideas around um, shared kitchens or I mean I, I used to work in a work like a work shared space I could see a kitchen being that sort of you rent it by the day and you come in and out and with that flexibility there's a need to to think ahead. Mm, so many great points. Um, before we talk about indoor environmental quality I thought I would give Christina a chance to talk about you know, I know the last question was you were like, this is my question because it's outdoor space and this is what I do landscape. And I wondered if you wanted to maybe add any points when we think about that indoor gathering space from, from your perspective. Sure. I think in many times when we're looking at these spaces and, and, and Leslie, when she said that, think about a library, that, and, and, but don't think about a library, but that was an important kind of an analogy. Well, we're looking at a space that can be flexible and used not just as a crushed space from a performance with people coming in and out of it. So how do we make that space vibrant? How do we make that space um, engaging? And how do we use, how do you use that space? I know everyone's kind of gotten run down the down the whole discussion about these these movable windows and movable walls. Um, I concur with Dave. We've had a number of projects in which these have been um, investigated and have all been abandoned. And these are projects with incredible commercial budgets, like massive commercial budgets with major entities who say they cannot maintain these, these things. So it's not, it's not viable with the systems that are currently in place. So how do we make this space that is engaging to people for other purposes other than just that crest space coming in and out of the theater and the conventional lobby? And how do you engage that with the exterior and the outdoors? And unfortunately, that may be windows, but but a window that doesn't move. So it's about the about the choice, and about the very um, pinpoint use of window and window wall or, or whatever type of wall um, that we actually have there that allows people to see out and engage with the outside and engage with the inside. So in many times, in many cases, when we're working, we're working very closely with the interior architect to translate the vision from the inside to the outside, outside to the inside. So the outside rooms become part of the inside, the inside becomes part of the outside. And there is, we do that through, through how we approach and, and that separation between those two spaces, 
but a but a consistency with respect to materiality and and um, the common elements as we move there. So the little bubble diagram that had of what the floor plan could be had that image of that Scott Street kind of extension or extension of Scott Street to the north all the way down to the side of the building. Then it said living room and kitchen. And, and really what was missing there was dining room. Well, if you've got a kitchen, don't you have a dining room? And is that dining room then outside as well as inside? And do you share that? Is there some sort of um, relationship where that the inside dining room, the outside dining room can can relate to one another? Is there a way that those that those edges, and like we're going to talk about blurred lines, but how do those edges kind of blur with each other so that the inside blurs with the outside, but the use kind of overlaps those, those spaces? So, you know, as we look at how do we encourage gathering indoors, number one thing that we always talk about even for outside is provide seating. Like, you go to a lobby of a, of a, of a theater, most, more often than not, there's very little seating involved in there. It's, it's to get you in, it's to get you out. A little bit of seating around the periphery, but that's about it. If you want to come and have people use that space on off time, then you have to provide them with those opportunities to use the space and sit down in the space and engage the space. And that could be whether or not it's tables and chairs, whether or not it's benches, whether or not it's some sort of equipment or furniture that allows people to use the space other than it just standing there. So even if you do have use that commercial kitchen and it becomes uh, an actualized restaurant, like they do have over at the APO, where they have a restaurant there. And it used to be Frank, now it's called, I think it's called a cafe or something along that line. But there's a physical restaurant at the base of the building that becomes a commercial entity, and there's a dining component there. Um, I mean, we have that ability because we have that Scott Street kind of extension there to have an outdoor cafe that, that spills out from them. So, you know, is that an opportunity that we can build upon on, on integrating outdoors and, and tying the indoors with the outdoors and having these spaces? And then those spaces, if it's not being used as a restaurant, can be used for people who want flexible workspaces or work outside or come from the community and want to sit down and there's Wi-Fi there to sit down and work and at a table or, or, at, or in an environment where they can be outside can be connected to some some um, amenities that are inside, whether or not it's washrooms, whether or not it's being able to grab a coffee, but then being able to really, really use that, that extension space, really use that outdoor and indoor, and then it would then become a more program space. It would then become a space that's used more than just the time of the performance and the evening of the performance before, in, before and just slightly after that. You just have to create those those moments, those experiences, and those opportunities in this, within the space, and then really then program that space to have those um, the elements there that would allow us to use it. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Christine. I think those are great points, and um, uh, making it really just providing multiple uh, options for people to use the space and whether that's dining or working or why just hanging up for a little bit while they're for a rest pot risk. Um, so Bettina, can we maybe land on the indoor environmental quality for the indoor spaces and then we'll move on. Sure. And I will try to be brief, although this will be difficult. So uh, what we know is that building design can definitely influence how we behave in a space that's known. And so we can design so that people are encouraged to move. People are encouraged to you do healthy behaviors. So one of those healthy behaviors, you can do that through what they call choice architecture. As much as we want this variety and this gorgeous you know, choice of food. We also want to encourage people to consider having healthy food, having appropriate food, etc. Uh, we want people to have also ways we can encourage people to socialize, to interact, to meet with one another. You know, how often have you been in in any space where there's a giant gathering? And if you happen to go with somebody, then you feel like at least you have your little bubble. But how are there ways that we can encourage people to create community? Uh, which leads me to this idea of um, of belonging again, which is just so high on my list of, of how, how does the space make us feel like we are and can be in that space. And uh, to me, it's, it's if you pretend that you're, if, if you can feel like you're actually a part of it, I know what's really important 
for the city, for all of us, is that uh, there's buy-in, that, that taxpayers are happy to pay for this new building, that the city is happy to approve it, that we can all feel like it belongs to us, that we can all feel like we can be a part of it. And, and so how, how can we do that in the indoor and the outdoor space? How can we create a little bit of flexibility to allow people to take part? I know, um, uh, you know, it, collaborative art pieces where, where people can just scribble a word or, you know, draw one little painting of a part of a painting, those, those kinds of things. And, and uh, not necessarily, you know, recognizing that a space can and will and should change all buildings. I think there was a study done, it was a couple of years ago at the Green Building Festival. The, the uses that were imagined way back when the building was envisioned to what it is when it's getting near starting to build to five years or 10 years later, often those are completely different. And 50 years from now, it will be even more completely different. Sure, there will be a theater and there will be spaces, but how we use them, none of us can fathom that yet because a lot of that will happen because of the people that are in and out of that building. So throughout that uh, growth, how can we ensure that people before, during and after feel like they are a part of that? Uh, and da, da, da. so, uh, just because it's, you may not know, Leslie, I, I think it's really important, uh, just like AODA is only 15 years old and, you know, hard fought and really great, but there's so much more we can do. It's really important that you understand that legislation and policy for indoor environmental quality is poor. I'll be generous. And so there, if you, if you have the chance to, especially if you're going to be, you know, this is an international competition, which is great because some, <clears throat> where I think there's a lot of local knowledge that I certainly hope you insist is part of that uh, design team, but as well, there is knowledge in, in places like Europe and Japan and other countries where their policies and legislations on what is required of the indoor environment are just so much better than ours right now. Uh, you know, it, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and David, I completely agree with you. ASHRAE, because of COVID, ASHRAE has come out with all these amazing recommendations about things that we can do to make our indoor spaces better. And you know, there's always going to be a battle, an inherent battle between energy and uh, air. But we have experts like Kara and and Ashray, and it, it is absolutely possible to create healthy, inclusive, accessible spaces. But it's there's no policy or regulation. We we have building certification labels like Well and Fitwell and what have you. But the, these are baby steps compared to what can be done. So the, the human side of things is in, you want to be net positive human, you've got to set net positive goals for that. And that that is, you can't even look to any policies or, or regulations for that. You're going to have to look to the uh, a team that really has human centric point of view. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sakina. There are a lot of perspectives that you share there. And I think that the overarching theme is that, you know, we're seeing that the requirements are shifting and, and growing and that we look at indoor air quality and, and what can be done in that space and, and, and bringing in more organic uh, materials and more safe materials. It, it's a journey for sure. We're going along. And Leslie, I think, has a comment to add. Um, thank you, Bettina, for that. I think I'll, I'll just leave it at this. One of the things that, um, or one of the one of the groups of people that are not necessarily part of this particular workshop right now are artists. And when I mean the artists, I mean like people that are very specifically have a vocation to be creative and to think. And usually around uh, a round table, around a round table like this, I would uh, like to populate it with some uh, people that live and breathe in the arts all day long. And that's where I think some of this stuff is gonna come out of um, the future conversations. And so um, I'm not saying it's just from that place, but just in terms of us thinking differently and the, you know, we started off this conversation by saying the arts were decimated through the pandemic. 
we were the first to go and we're the last to come back. And those artists became incredibly creative over the last couple of years in terms of how to find space, how to create space, how to gather. And I'm not even talking about virtually. <laughs> so um, I think that this is a, a really, really important conversation. And I just wanted to mention that uh, it's top of mind for us. Thank you so much, Leslie. I think it does speak to that real need for the collaborating with the people who are using the space and getting insurance or ensuring that we have that understanding. And I feel that there are going to be some, hopefully some good nuggets that come out of today's workshop and perhaps some great, wonderful things that you'll carry forward and some things that will be adjusted through your collaboration with the users of the space. And um, I do want to recognize we're running, uh, uh, we're having great discussion. And then we have a few more discussion topic areas that I'm hoping that we can get through. Um, so the next one, I do believe we have already covered it quite a bit, and that is around blurring the lines. Oh, oh, there might be a gamification thing there. Spacing out what? Um, okay, so when we talk about blurring the lines, we have a lot of um, We've had a lot of ideas of, around blurring the lines and I just in, in the spirit of, of trying to get to a, a couple other points around sustainability, around future proofing, around um, diversity, uh, and also looking at what the community would be benefiting from this. So there's a few other questions that we want to try to hit on, um, touch on and recognize we have about an hour to go. Um, I'm going to try to do this more like, you know, those um, nighttime TV shows when you have a rapid fire response. That's what we're going to try for in the next little while. We're going to try for rapid fire. So your response will be, you know, sort of a minute or you might hear, and eh. okay, <laughs> I won't do that. Uh, but we're going to try to do a very short, concise, you know, give us your top answer. And if we have time, we'll get back to one more top answer that you might have. And just so that we can hear from everybody and try to move through these other pieces, which I think are very valuable for the, the TO Live team. If that's okay with you, I'm not seeing any frustrated looking faces. I'm getting a thumbs up. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate your, um, oh, I just wanted to make sure you saw that. For those of you who are taking your, your gamification seriously, um, we're gonna move past, we're not gonna do the word cloud here. So I just wanna, oh, is this another gamification already? Because we were going to do something before this, but we're moving through more quickly. So just wanted to remind us of what the sustainable vision is for this. We're looking at being future facing for a decarbonized world. I think that is something that we have fundamentally used as a guiding principle throughout this. And I wanted to also remind us one thing that Mike said earlier is around making sure that what we're proposing or anything recommendations that we're making do consider the building operator and consider the operations in terms of that, that um, decarbonized world vision. So with those things in mind, we're going to move into, oh yes, I had some fun with my with my uh, animations. Okay, so now we're getting into, um, this is one of the final three discussion points when it, this is on diversity. And so when we think about diversity, it's really uh, something that we talked about and we've heard about um, from Eliada and from others, as in maybe it's like third mode of communication, like thinking beyond uh, the ego and, and beyond the you and I right here and now and, and looking at how do we ensure that there is a space for that sense of belonging for everyone, that sense of co-ownership, the sense of co-facilitation you know facilitation of, of these things so that there's not only today in what we know with the way that the world has evolved so rapidly in the last even five years, even two years, we are coming so far in, in learning about how we can be much more inclusive and expand beyond you know, diversity, inclusion, and equity. And so this, this D dot idea is our, our way of, of incorporating that kind of more forward thinking. And this is that decolonization with inclusivity, diversity, equity, and the triple A is you know, accessibility, anti-violence and anti-racism and lots of other antis that you might want to put into the A. So this is going a little bit more mindful of how we can go beyond the, when we think about going beyond accessibility and going beyond indoor air quality, I think the idea 
is intended to go beyond you know the base requirement on equity diversity and inclusion so that when we think about those things um, i just wanted to consider are there things that we should be kind of advocating for or recommending for STLC next to, to consider in this design competition and that a lot of these things we have touched on already so it's going to be rapid fire use of shape and it doesn't have to be anything on this list of considerations these are just trying to get our thought processes moving and going on this um, so I'm going to use the original um, circle of introductions so we're going to start with Bettina and then we're going to go from Bettina to I think my next person on with Kara and then Dave Peterson and then we'll go to I think it's uh, sorry it's Bettina, Kara, Christine, Dave Peterson, Nicole and Sebastian and I don't know if Mike Singleton is going to chime in so with that I'm going to turn it over to you Bettina to tell us in quick answer. Quick answer is approaches to Sustainability include people, and including people, you need to consider it holistically. You can't just think about one component like IAQ as a proxy. You have to have a wholesome view of it. Succinct, beautiful. Thank you so much. We're going to move on, and if we can, we'll get back to you. Kara, do you have some thoughts on that as well? Um, the functionality is the biggest thing. I think people are going to have their hands on parts of the building and not just having a little sign, but being able to really experience what a sustainable building um, that is future ready feels like is going to be important. Thank you so much, Kara. I appreciate that. Um, I just want to, before we move on to uh, Christine, I just want to note Miles has uh, written a lead pilot credit about gender inclusive washrooms and today she's noticed um, that people are still thinking inside the box why are we separating washrooms into here and uh, here are the urinals here are the toilets people will still whether consciously or subconsciously gender them so that is also something to be mindful of and I appreciate you bringing that perspective forward for us to consider Miles thank you Christine um, do you have a short thought on uh, diversity yes uh, just two words, uh, engagement, and then ownership. Not ownership of the building, but, I mean, but a more comprehensive ownership of the participants, the users, in the community. That's it. Short and sweet. These are short, sweet, and powerful. Um, engagement, ownership, with and collaborating with the participants. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I feel a bit weird. I just had this awareness that I'm saying, let's rush through diversity. Hang on, wait a minute, that hurts my feelings. I don't want to do that. So we'll take as much time as we need to unpack this. I, I apologize for trying to push people faster, but we'll maybe do another round table so that everyone can have a second chance to voice thoughts. Um, the next person on my round table is Dave Peterson. Um, so two words for me as well. I think it, it has to be um, engaging and it has to be memorable. People have to be able to take away from this and, and apply it to the rest of their lives. It has to be something cool. It has to have an interesting component to it because if it's not memorable, um, it just gets stuck with all the minutiae of our lives and, and we need to, to rise above that, I think. Great point, Dave. I love that memorable. It's a, that sort of decent the narrative. And the next person in my round table is Ray. Apologies, I have to step away to make a call, so I'm not exactly sure what we are listing, but accessibility is, <laughs> can that be my word? <laughs> Sorry, Leslie, you're on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Kayleigh. I think that we were just trying to, because we have a, a couple of different discussion points to get through, we're trying to be a little bit more concise in our responses or what are our, the things that we really want to make sure that we're considering beyond, you know, base equity, diversity, and inclusion that can be considered for the, the design today and into the future. So if you want to extend on accessibility, feel free. Um. I would say an inclusive design process. Um, so ensuring that the process of inclusive or that inclusive design is is present from the start. 
um, to completion of the project in, in all of the ways. That's great. Thank you so much. I think that's the best practice for sure. Um, the next person I have in my round table, and Mike, I don't know if you're still online and you wanted to share something at this point. Yeah, hi, I am, I'm still here. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I had anything to add that we haven't heard already. Um, there's um, uh, some great ideas there. I would just say regarding um, diversity, I mean, to me, Toronto is uh, um, already an example of, an, of a society that is embracing, or a place that is embracing um, diversity and, and certainly multiculturalism. And I think we, you know, we still have a ways to go, obviously. Um, but I think this, again, the, the notion of this project being iconic, um, let's think about ways that we can ensure that it um, delivers on um, that um, kind of diversity philosophy and, and make a statement and really truly make it uh, an iconic building that represents um, everyone that lives in Toronto. Thanks, Mike. I think we are on the journey with long, uh, lots of improvement opportunities along the way. And I think, Leslie, were you going to chime in on this? Sorry, Leslie, I wasn't sure if you wanted to add something. Oh, sorry, I, I, my, I had a little uh, blip. Um, I think that um, just building on this, what Mike just said, I, I think um, it'd be really great to get back to a very simple human kind of motivation, which I tend to love, which is about curiosity. and. I think we've we we lose something as we get older, and that is um, I just put it in the chat. I meant to send it to all, but I sent it to Bettina. This idea of being awesome, as in being awestruck, and I think we've been all talking about ideas that are going to surprise, that are going to engage, that are going to give us these human emotions that we really want. <laughs> out of this this not just this new building but this new arena where humans are going to be gathering to do all sorts of things and i want it to be awesome as in being awestruck and awesome as being brilliant thank you so much that's inspiration for sure um i love the curiosity piece i think it helps us stay young in a way to question things. And Nicole, do you have anything that you want to add when you think about how can we make this a diverse space now and into the future? Um, yeah, so I think it uh, it builds a little bit on what um, Miles was saying in the chat in talking about gender inclusive washrooms and and um, they were saying that you know stalls are a very American way and European, a lot of other places in the world. And I mean, my mind immediately went to Europe uh, approaches washrooms with you know fully enclosed rooms and communal sinks so washrooms aside but just that comment about washrooms made me think that um there's probably a lot of opportunity to look towards other places who are way better at this than we are um who have been doing these things almost naturally and without thinking for you know a long time um and instead of trying to maybe reinvent something to to look to look to these other places in the world um about what they do that works so well and incorporate those concepts into um, into this building Here. i think there there's a great um there's value in being informed by the practices of other and those leading end practices from around the world and to Leslie's point in the chat, she said David Magnusford that if we want to be transformational, we need to do things differently. And sometimes doing things differently is not necessarily uh, to the point of the pigs again. It's it's uh, you know it, it's maybe doing doing things differently, and yet still leveraging the best evidence informed knowledge that we have, but changing the way we approach it. 
And so I think that, that yeah, I, I think that there's lots of really important and valuable perspectives that we're bringing forward here. And I appreciate your point. So we should take a look outside of our current reality and see how others are doing it that we can learn from them. Um, the next person on my round table that we'll end this discussion on, unless we want to do one more round, would be Sebastian. Sebastian, correct. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I really, I really like that idea of curiosity. Awesome, a lot of inspiration to it as well. And and just thinking about what Haley was talking about in terms of engagement and it being a process and and treating this as as a co-design with. The, the idea around inclusion, around diversity. And I would say this is the beginning of the journey or the beginning of the story, and it shouldn't end in design. And the way we keep, um, keep this building relevant from a diversity perspective is we keep treating this as an ongoing design process that carries through the life of the building. That is a great point. Um, it's an iterative process that we can continue to adapt and, and, and reinvigorate the maybe some of the, the murals or the colors or the things that we have uh, originally come to the storyline with that as the process evolves and the journey evolves that we will also do so with this, this space. Um, I don't want to be insensitive to the importance of this topic so I recognize we have about 35, 40 minutes left in our discussion today. And I wonder if people want to have one more opportunity or we can come back to it at the end if there's time. Maybe that's the best way to do it. Um, so I'm going to suggest we move on and we'll come back to this if, if time permits. Okay, so the next area for a discussion is around climate sustainability. And now this is something that I know is near and dear to everybody's hearts. So I expect that we'll have some, some great thoughtful suggestions for the design competition to keep in mind when it comes to this idea of climate sustainability. And climate sustainability is not only about heating and cooling loads, it's also about these changing weather uh, in, incidents and, and uh, um, you know, extreme weather conditions that we're seeing anom anomalously that are becoming more normal. Um, so I'm going to do the a popcorn order, so it won't be the same order that we just did, just to try to keep things fresh. Why don't we start this one with Dave Peterson, if that's okay? It is. Um, and it's a, it's a great question, I think, and, and it's one that I'll try to be concise and, and, and short-winded on. Um, so there's, there's a real interesting microclimate in this area where this building is. Um, and I've done some work on projects to the north, some work to the south. Um, winds aloft are very different. Um, some real challenges in terms of peak gusts and what's happening with all these new tall buildings surrounding this. Um, so the consequence of sort of, you know, stronger winds, stronger gusts certainly impact um, what I do in terms of design pressure, in terms of how we connect key components, in terms of how durable they are over time. Uh, and just because, you know, we've got buildings in that area that are, you know, 150 years old that have, let's say, existing fenestration that's that old, doesn't mean that it stays in place. Um, and so I think we really have to look at as climate changes or continues to change, what some of these challenges will be on the built or the building itself in terms of um, structural capacity, um, certainly rain. I mean, I think just recently uh, Toronto luckily missed a 250 millimeter rain event, which was touted to be a, a you know, billion dollar um, sort of challenge in terms of the insurable components within the city. So. That's the other side of the equation, these massive amounts of, of rainfall, um, uh, higher winds, um, you know, temp temperatures aside, I mean, we, we, we see this, we see these challenges. So this building has to, uh, I think, um, work well in conditions that really other buildings maybe haven't seen or the, the, the amount of cycling that we're seeing is substantially quicker, more severe. Um, so this building is going to have to, um, to adapt and, and sort of work within this new changing environment. Thanks so much, Dave. Those are great points. And, and uh, you know, this is really around that, uh, how are we readying ourselves for this changing climate? And, and also within the decarbonized world that we're striving to be a part of. And um, I think those are great points. I think the next person I'm going to, to, to ask to speak on this is Nicole. Do you have some thoughts? Are you 
preparatory. I don't know if you're on another call. Are you good? Uh, yeah. Could you, could you come back to me in five minutes? I'll come back to you in five minutes. Thank you. Okay, for sure. Um, I had a feeling because she was covering her microphone. Sorry about that. Uh, so if we move on, then thinking about that decarbonized future and, and sustainability, let me ask Christine, do you have some thoughts on what this building can do? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I think that it's already been touched upon, but water, rain. <clears throat> we all know about these, 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 though we may have missed that gigantic rain event, we've all know of in recent times of those events that have flooded the DVP and Union Station. And what you hear of the Union's water pouring down this, pouring into Union Station. And it becomes more and more of an issue and serious issue about how do we deal with this rainwater? How do we, uh, even on our site, the, the fact that we have to capture and reuse this rainwater. So this becomes a critical issue. I mean, the sizing of this cistern um, and our strategies in which to, to reuse and capture that rainwater on site. So um, all of those become a critical issue that, you know, as a landscape architect, I work I work closely and hand in hand with civil and mechanical engineers in order that we actually figure out how do we deal with this? How do we deal with these, these issues of, of water, which is destructive? Water is, water and fire are two equalizers, right? And it's non, it's non-discriminating. They will equal, they, and they will create an unfathomable destruction in their path. So, how do we how do we deal with this? I mean, thankfully we don't have we don't have wildfires here in Toronto that we have to deal with, but we do have water, and we have these incredible rain events um, that happen now with more frequency. And so, what do we do with them? And how do we build upon these strategies in which to deal with them and to deal with this rainwater? I, so earlier when we were talking about uh, you know, um, and I mentioned gray water, um, and it, it and that may be part of the discussion that we it's going to need to be played. Um, traditionally, the development world hates gray water toilets just as the, the cost. Um, it may be that this is the this is the future that that you know in, in order to deal with this, it it may be what is a requirement a base requirement is that there are going to be gray water toilets in these in these public facilities, and that we are reusing this cistern and sizing this cistern in which to accommodate the, the capture of that and harvested rainwater for things like the toilets and for things such as um, irrigation. And then it becomes that much more important that the level of, of landscape um, becomes more resilient um, to reuse some of this water as, as we have to release some of that within within the environment. So just, just a couple thoughts on that with respect to climate and its impact on what would be the landscape. Thank you so much, Christine. I think those are really important um, points as we look at the hydrogeological cycle that's continu continually shifting. Um, and you mentioned that having to work with the mechanical to make sure that what you were doing uh, in the building could accommodate. And so I thought this would be a natural segue to bring Kara into the discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think here uh, myself and Sebastian are going to be very much on the same page. Um, this building should be carbon neutral. It should not have natural gas on site beyond what's required by code. Um, maybe by the time we've built it, it won't need to have it at all. At the moment, natural gas emergency generators are required wired there's no battery alternative but if you separate out things you want backed up from things that are life safety you can still have a substantial battery backed up um, resilience center so the air conditioning for um, the parts of the facility that you're using in a power outage etc cetera, etc cetera, um, all being off of gas uh, beyond that, using as little energy as possible, um, despite the fact that I love making sure that water balances are effective. Um, it's worth saying that in the city of Toronto, our um, water comes out of the lake and it's very low carbon impact. 
So it may also be important to identify how your building impacts the environment. What are the most important ways it does, right? Transportation, making sure people aren't driving their cars is probably huge because you're gathering people from all over the city. Um, so you'd have a much larger impact giving everyone a free, free tan transit pass with their ticket than you would by entirely eliminating the use of potable water in, in the building. So figuring out the magnitude of the impacts of all of the things that come into your building so that you really dial in where you want the architect to focus their attention to make the most benefit, I think. That's a, a really innovative idea of having your tickets tied to a transit pass or something. I, I've, I've never heard that before. Um, I love it. I, and agree with all your other points. And we're going to try to get around the table and hear everyone else's thoughts on this. And I don't know. Sorry. Um, sorry, just checking. I'm going to throw it to Bettina at this point and hear what you have to say. Unless, Nicole, I think you were ready. I'm ready. Yes. Go for it. Um, oh, so sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Sorry, Nicole. I thought, yeah, so you know what we're talking about here? I appreciate the extra few minutes. Um, yeah, so it, this kind of ties in to uh, what Christine was saying about and and others were saying about the rain events and the amount of rain and the water and and um, I'm in this case I'm going to tie it back specifically to the building enclosure, um, but in this case the below grade building enclosure. So we're looking at going uh, three stories below grade here according to the initial uh, preliminary plans, right? And given how close this is to uh, the current lakeshore, the old lakeshore in Toronto, I'm guessing that the water table is pretty high. Um, and the so I in when we're talking about um, you know fu the future climate um, and those kinds of things and looking at uh, sustainability in that sense the um, concerns worries things to consider um, about going three stories below grade with a, a presumably high water table with you know increased rain events um, contributing to even higher temporary, a temporarily higher water table um, during those events uh, and considerations of how water stays out of those below grade spaces um, becomes very important and it becomes much more than just your typical below grade waterproofing that we see on most projects. Um, I would think that uh, I mean, obviously, things need to be studied and more information is needed, but um, my my first initial kind of thought was, is this whole below grade area going to need to be quote unquote bathtubbed with a uh, a continuous membrane, right, from grade down underneath, around and up, um, if it's sitting, you know, in the water table, if that water table is expected to increase over time as we see more heavy rain events, um, and how is that going to impact the the enclosure and, and that below grade enclosure with uh, you know we don't we don't necessarily talk about a whole lot um, because it's fairly easy to just throw some waterproofing and a bunch of insulation on it. Um, nobody sees it. <laughs> so it uh, it's not something that that necessarily gets a lot of attention, but um, with that Below grade water considerations, uh, it, it becomes a little bit of a different a different conversation. All right, thanks, Nicole. Great point. Sorry, Lessa, you wanted to say something? Um, it just made me think of uh, an, a, a point hearing about the clever idea about tying the ticket to the uh, transit. This building is a civic asset. It really is, uh, you know, the the real estate is owned by the city and it really should be, when we talk about ownership, owned by the people. <laughs> and so the more ideas that the people have that use it, that can be adapted with these kinds of things, the better. And I think it sends a message to City Hall. <laughs> in terms of how important a building like this is and what is needed and so the participation 
uh, as an ongoing factor, not just in these workshops, is really, really critical. So I love hearing these ideas. Me too. It's very exciting. And I uh, thanks, thanks for chiming in and, and supporting the, the energy that's around the table here, Leslie. Um, Bettina, I think I was going to uh, uh, bring you into the discussion. And then I think we have, uh, we would like to hear from Sebastian and I don't know, Dave McMillan, if you wanted to chime in on this as well, but and, and Devin, but just want to make sure that you feel welcome to chime in at any point. Go ahead, Bettina. Uh, sorry, just to add Jay's point about uh, this below grade, just from an LCA, from an embodied carbon point of view as well, just something to consider. <coughs> Definitely not my area of expertise, but that's a lot of concrete and a lot of material to dig down and, and protect. Uh, and so uh, from my from the human perspective, obviously, uh, from a sustainability point of view, uh, we are climate changed and it will continue to change. And what we're going to see is more extreme events and those what can we do what can we ask of a building to help humans in those extreme events whether they are working uh, visiting passing through whatever it be uh, any of our buildings and uh, cooling is definitely going to be a critical element uh, refuge again is going to be a critical element uh, healthy spaces where uh, people feel they belong Yeah, I'd echo that on the embodied carbon side of going three uh, floors down and all of the concrete, all of the insulation required for that, and then still all of the heat lost out of that uh, space as well. So, you know, it is a huge impact uh, to go that deep. Um, you know, the other thing to just go back to is making sure that um, you know, energy distribution systems are compatible with these, um, you know, our net zero goals. And, you know, I'd suggest that it makes sense right now to install low carbon heating systems. If they're not being considered, uh, they should be. Um, and in the, the event they aren't actually installed now, uh, you know, make sure low temperature distribution is in place, other tools like that that'll uh, enable, um, um, you know, moving to those low carbon heating uh, systems in the future. I think um, also when we're taught, we were talking about some of this space and the different uses, going back to zoning as well, making sure HVAC that's zoned uh, appropriately, uh, uh, you know, and maybe having the occupancy or um, CO controls, um, you know, to control some of those flow rates is important as well, right? So um you know yeah but the the embodied carbon thing i think would be my big concern with going that deep as well thanks Devin. um dave mcmillan did you want to add anything uh, seba you go go ahead you were you were oh, first sorry, please. yeah <laughs> i'm sure a lot of the points that, that we'll make will be similar and by the way it's great to hear everyone have such such great views on, on sustainability. I'll talk about it from the energy side because that's where I live on my day-to-day -day basis. And what I'll do is I'll offer some some thoughts on what I see when I see an RFP that makes me smile. Um, and hopefully we can take it from there. Um, when we design buildings these days, we look at the last 50 years worth of weather to design a building that will live 50 years, 100 years in the future. There's requirements for that, and that's fine, but I think this project needs to have requirements that force us to look into the future. Um, it's a complex building, it's a, a very ambitious building. Energy considerations and energy modeling or some sort of energy discussion needs to happen very early on. Um, as, a, as a group or as, as the owners, surround yourself with trusted advisors that can help you go through through those points and can help you um, kind of review or identify the different um, proponents and the different options you have um, is, is gonna be key. Um, do not waver on this idea of zero carbon. Stick to it, make it a requirement, put it in the RFP and the sign teams will figure it out. Um, as kind of echoing what Kara said, no fossil fuels, 
the net zero carbon, it can be designed. And if we push enough, it will be um, designed. Um, and, and yeah, because of the uniqueness of the building, this is a conversation and there's gonna be a lot of lenses and energy sustainability, um, occupants, indoor air quality, they're all parts that play into this. And, and it is really about surrounding yourself with, with a group of people that can really leverage and, and grow that network. Uh, and this design process on the, on the RFP side will be a team, a team and a network option. And um, to, to the team here, you have access to an amazing group of, of people that have done high performance buildings and don't, don't, uh, don't hesitate to kind of leverage that and those connections. Yeah. Oh, should I go? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, on the basement, I totally hear the comments on embodied carbon. I, I, I think as far as I understand, there already is some below grade structure. And from my discussions with Creatio, my understanding is that only a portion will be excavated further. Uh, it's, you know, again, this is just the current design, but, you know, I think the, I've been pushing them hard to think carefully about embodied carbon, but I mean, there's also some uh, just logistics, I guess, given the, the use, right? So I think balancing that's important. The water piece, absolutely critical given we're below grade in a, you know, close to the, to the lake. Um, I think on the, on the energy source side, look, there's a good chance I'll be helping to write this RFP with Creatio. The goal is GHGI of zero, like to be perfectly clear, that is a requirement for city buildings, gonna be pushing that. Um, in terms of the technology, there was, uh, there was a discussion, about, there was a mention of geo exchange. I think because of the partial excavation, geo exchange may actually be quite difficult here. Um, not all is lost, of course. Uh, there's a large trunk sewer on Front Street right in front of the building. You know, that's an opportunity we should take advantage of if, uh, and and I think we will look at that. You know, the city, we're, we're doing a lot of work on that front right now. Deep Lake water cooling is about 150 meters away. It's another opportunity. The point is like zero carbon is gonna be the solution or is gonna be the goal. The solution will take some uh, further analysis, but uh, you know, absolutely that's, that's to come through in the RFP if uh, if I have anything to do with it. Wonderful. Thanks, David. Was someone about to chime in there? Sorry, go for it. I'm, I'm just glad David said that he's going to be responsible because I thought everyone was looking at me. <laughs> um, I wanted, this might have been clear when you've been studying uh, the test fit. And it is true, there's already uh, two floors of excavation now in the building. We have uh, limitations because of the, the footprint can, cannot uh, go up any higher than uh, a certain degree uh, due to no shadowing requirements on Bursey Park. And so in order to fit the program that we originally came out of the public consultation, we had to go down another floor. It was not anyone's idea of a good time, specifically because of the natural light, never mind all the sustainability issues, but the light is a, a huge factor in that, which was interesting. But again, it was a test fit. Um, and if we're gonna prioritize things, and I'm not just saying that because I've got all of you listening, but sustainability is a number one priority. And I think there's certain things that are are going to change and adapt with the design competition with the architects. Um, the RFP is a starting place, but the creatives are going to put, you know, their stamp on it as well. And so, I'm really, really open uh, to adapt the building program if we can achieve certain things, especially around sustainability, because I think there's uh, a lot of effort on everyone's part to achieve the things that we've been talking about today. So, um, we'll do our best. But David, this one's on you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on it's on record. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Are we recording this? Uh oh, can we delete uh, that part, please? <laughs> <laughs> we do, uh, so I'm gonna skip. I think we talked a lot about future proofing here. So I because we have one more question that I would like to explore. Actually, let me ask Leslie. You, we have a choice here to go into future proofing further, which we have touched on in, when we talked about sustainability, 
or looking at what can we offer to the SPLC Next design team and, and this process to help them to provide the, you know, really the marketing, the, 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 the narrative for the benefits, the value that this will bring to the immediate community, to Toronto at large, and to the betterment of the environment, or any of the any of the talking points that we feel could help them as they navigate the um, it continued stakeholder consultation process. Let me, before I, I pose either of these questions, let me just turn to Leslie and ask: Do you have a preference? Uh, I definitely don't don't have a preference. I think um, I love hearing the conversation to continue what people are most passionate about. I mean, I think I've got a pretty clear indication. Um, and in terms of this process, and David, I'm not sure how much um, you're aware of the timeline at this point, but the RFP is in two phases. So there's an RFQ that's going out first, um, which should be public by the end of September. And then a short list is gonna be created sometime probably in October. And then there's going to be at least two months where at least two months maybe a little bit more um, which takes us to the end of the year where the a short list of a handful of architectural teams will be um, going into competition so the public engagement as leslie just mentioned is going to continue throughout this process and there will be touchdowns and um, i know there's going to be lots of conversations particularly with all of the agencies that we're working with now at the city, which include um, David, but also with heritage, transportation, urban planning, et cetera, et cetera. So there's there's a lot going on in a pretty short period of time. So the more concise our recommendations are to the competitive teams, I think the better. Um, and then there will be uh, you know an awarded contract, and then there's going to be more work. Like I see this as such an iterative project in terms of where we're going to get to next because we have to go back to city council uh, sometime in the spring of uh, the second quarter of 2023 with uh, the the awarded design with a new budget and with all of the things that we're talking about and that's going to keep going through the process so all of these things i think when people if you're following the project you'll see there's going to be many touch points um, to to weigh in and hopefully keep us all on track. Okay, so if we, if, if just maybe I'm going to ask the question slightly differently, and then and then I'll make an executive decision if there isn't one. But we will be providing, um, you know, documentation. We'll try to keep it very concise on the specific recommendations under under, and I might take them from different places and put them in the in a, uh, an order that makes sense from an RFP standpoint. For your purposes to ingest and, and use as you, you can will to support your efforts. So when we look at this highlighting the value, this could be beneficial to um, talking to the uh, city council to help them understand the multitude of benefits from from different angles. This can be useful to um, talking to stakeholders. And so if you would if you because it will already be written for you, you could take of it what you will. It might be helpful um, and also the future proofing i think we did touch on a number of those things and we can certainly touch on it further so um, both are options we could maybe start with the value uh, highlighting the value and if there's time we could go back to future proofing is maybe how i'd recommend we proceed unless you feel differently you're giving thumbs up okay so i think we have touched on a lot of values that are going to be um, something that people that will use this space will really walk away from and to use Dave's word, Dave Peterson's word, like they're, they're gonna remember this, you know, and there's, there's, they're gonna learn from it. There's all these wonderful things that we've talked about. And so if we're gonna try to put this in like a, a with them or what's in it for me, for the neighborhood, for the city, for all the different stakeholders, for heritage buildings, for um, uh, think of all the different potential stakeholder bodies out there what are the things we should be highlighting that are a, a value proposition for this building to Toronto? And as you noodle on that, I will maybe ask uh, Mike Singleton to chime in first. Uh, 
Um, yeah, thanks, Patina, or thanks, uh, Leslie. That's the second time I've done that. Um, uh, you know, again, I've harped on this a few times now, but this idea of um, this iconic neighborhood, um, not sure it benefits a lot from gridlock, which always seems to be the case on those uh, streets there, uh, uh, Richmond and and uh, Front Street. Um, Richmond almost seems to have constant construction project happening on it. Uh, I'd love to see way more walkability in this entire neighborhood, um, but also recognize that cars are, are a reality. Um, uh, so I think you know using uh, the closure of Scott Street as a as a sort of um, you know a, a proxy for uh, how we might um, improve uh, walkability and you know this this idea of of having um, this uh, campus, if you will, be a destina destination for more than just you know going to see a live performance, but um, I have a whole bunch of activities happening there, and we've we've heard a bunch we've heard a bunch of them already. Um, but this is, this should be a destination. This this area is already a destination with the market and Brucey Park and so on. And so there's just a real great opportunity to um, uh, amplify uh, that concept here and and um, dividing it up with uh, busy roads. Uh, I'm not sure is is um, adding uh, to to that outcome. Uh, I didn't get a chance to comment on um, the last topic area, and all I would say about that is we heard from Bill Lett, I believe, on Monday about um, the the strength of the integrated uh, project delivery, and I really want to uh, encourage uh, the Toronto team and Leslie to, uh, if you can, to embrace that concept because uh, you know we are you are going to set pretty aggressive goals and. And we've heard about those with the zero carbon and so on. Everybody has to, everyone involved in the project and the you know design and ultimately the construction uh, needs to embrace that outcome as well. And uh, if you bring those people in at the beginning, and these includes the constructors and the trades and everybody that's associated with, with ultimately with building this building, get them to buy into that outcome, then you'll eliminate that that value engineering risk that. We always hear about with with um, buildings of this nature. So I really encourage you to use that. It's highly effective, um, and uh, will um, you know kind of guarantee uh, that you might get the outcomes that you're looking for in terms of a truly uh, high performance building. And I'm just looking at the Sebastian's the lawn bowling concept. Uh, as it happens, my grandfather was a designer. Uh, Bowling Greens and well known in Ontario. He's long since passed away, but I think I can find his notes. So uh, um, that would be so cool to have lawn bowling down there or bocce ball or bull, as they call it in France. Anyway, I'm digressing. I'll turn it back to you, Leslie. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike, and thank you for um, sharing your thoughts on the sustainability piece too. Leslie, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> Sorry. Um... I, I'm, I'm obsessed with the storytelling for a reason. I keep talking about this being a civic asset, but the fact of the matter is uh, TO Live is going to be going into a capital campaign to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. That's from other orders of government and private and corporate. So the storytelling is critical. I think all of this conversation has to resonate with the people that we're going to be asking money from. We know the governments have agendas, and I think that shouldn't be a difficult story, but we still have to be very clear. It's going to be very interesting when we're looking for corporate naming, you name it, you name it, <laughs> you can name it. Um, there's there's really a, a, a long road ahead of us in terms of raising the money for this property. And so I love everything that is going to feed into a narrative that is crystal clear that is good for everybody good for the public realm good for sustainability good for the future etc cetera, etc cetera. so when i hear these things i'm thinking about how i'm pitching as well um so this has to resonate it has to resonate with everyone and i agree right from the beginning right from the construction workers this we, we can't waver at any point because this is actually what i think is going to sell 
Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that, Leslie. Uh, and I know that I think the whole team agrees wholeheartedly that integrated design is, is the way to go. Um, so I, sorry, next on the list for seeking input on the SAIU proposition, I'm going to ask uh, Sebastian. Um, I really like storytelling as a way of communicating things. I think when you find people's values and you can can articulate it in a way that, that resonates, I think that's that's the best way to get mobilization and get people to buy in. So for me, as someone who's close to this neighborhood, this excitement around the potential of this hub as a cornerstone to a, a growing neighborhood that ties into the St. Lawrence market that allows the neighborhood to continue to articulate its, its multiculturalism um, and, and really provide some, some um, support to the arts as they've gone through um, a really challenging time. So the story around the future, the story around the flexibility, the ability to incorporate neighborhood multiculturalism, um, multi or transgenerational um, programming. Um, I just, Focusing on on that side and, and the future is really where at least my values lie. And, and I look and, and say, okay, well, this is something that I want to get excited with that I that I am excited about. Um, and it's it's at this early stage. So um, to me, it's about the future. It's about what this hub can represent uh, at the neighborhood scale, at the art scale, at the city scale. And as as Mike was saying, it's it's a destination that excites you that inspires you and and that's really the, the the message that that i would say to to anyone who's going to have to deal with the construction side of these things it's about the future not now it's the future i love that that's so great um and you know it speaks to that bringing the toilet inside the house people are like what and then you're like no it's really good so um, yeah, I think we can we can build some strong narratives and, and try to help with the marketing of this. And I wanted to turn it to Haley Ray, if maybe you could share some thoughts on, you know, how, what's the value proposition that you might want to highlight uh, for this project for um, like TO Live? Um, I think what Leslie was noting about the narratives resonates with me um, in previous background experiences. The idea of um, these woven narratives has always been really um, strongly uh, connected to to my outlook on um, design in the built environment. And I think the really lovely thing about art is that it extends across um, all demographics, all complexities of our sort of um, identities. And, you know, it, it's just something that all of us can be involved with. And I think um, there are some parallels there in the approach to um, thinking about accessibility and the ways in which um, disability, be it permanent, temporary, or situational, sort of um, impacts all of our lives. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Wonderful. Thank you, Haley Ray. Um, can I turn it to Christine for your thoughts on the? Um, I think that as you try to engage with the community, um, in order to bring them into your vision, I think that you're going to have to take, um, um, present it to them <clears throat> in a way, as we do with all, we do a bunch of community consultation things, present it to them in a way that, that explains to them really what are their benefits. What, and you, the, the statement here is truly the, the correct. Like, what can we say to the community to bring them and make them feel more engaged? That, that they're with all the disruption and all that this is going to cause to them, I know that they understand that this is what's the end, this is the vision, this is what's going to happen at the end. So it's about telling them about the story that you that, that's going to happen, that, that you are going to have a rejuvenated free state. <clears throat> you're going to have these connections to Bursey that the whole area will be re envisioned and, and the connection to Front Street. The connection to Scott Street, the that whole um, public realm will be a new, new revitalized space, a space that they then can can participate in. Um, and it, it, you're going to have to explain to them about 
it's the, it's the economics, and I translate that into saying these new opportunities for commercial ventures have to be presented in a way and have to be built in a way that it offers them the most opportunity for success. Nothing is worse than creating all these spaces that that are just doomed for failure or just are, are vacant. We have seen other buildings in which um, the intention was that they're going to have involvement from community colleges in this, with respect of um, art displays or a commercial kitchen or a teaching kitchen or a restaurant, all of this. And, and many of them have failed and it failed on opportunity and it failed in actually delivery. So if you're going to promise that type of thing to the community, then it really has to be foolproof that it's actually deliverable. Um, there's no point promising it's going to be a commercial kitchen that's open to everybody that of all ethnicity and all um, you know economic backgrounds if that's never going to happen. And and then all that really does is just entrench this uh, this attitude of mistrust of what's happening with the, with the government levels, all government levels and government buildings. So I think that as you put forward this and and open up this dialogue with the community, there's going to have to be a lot of honesty on your part and really thinking about what you can deliver and what are the benefits you truly can give to the community rather than a whole shopping list of things that as we talk about today, and there have been a lot of blue sky stuff about it, but a, re a realistic approach of how you can, how, what you can offer to the community and tell them this is what we're, we're considering um, so that you can break down those barriers of distrust about, about what the city has said that they're going to get and what actually comes to fruition is, is, is often very, very different. So I think that's going to be really important as, as you um, look to this highlight what's important and what's going to be really important to the neighborhood is, is be a little bit brutal and honest with yourselves about what you can deliver and then what you can deliver, do it really, really well. So mm -hmm. um, that what they get and that the, what they being the community get is something that really is special, really is spectacular. But rather than a big shopping list of things, a, a real honest you know, approach of what you deliver, believe you can deliver and deliver well to the community, I think is going to be important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's authentic trust building and, and sort of only sharing out what you really truly are going to be moving forward with. Yeah. Thanks, Christine. Um, I'm going to turn it to Nicole for her thoughts on, I think we can also consider yeah. the various stakeholder groups. There's the neighborhood, there's the city council, there's lots of different stakeholder groups that we have to consider the messaging for. So it's not necessarily promising the sky, it's promising you know, what we think this is going to benefit them or how it's going to. Yeah, and actually that kind of, uh, the different stakeholder groups and what I was going to say is kind of the, keeping in mind the subset of those stakeholder groups and, and the wide variation of um, people in terms of, you know, where in their life experience they are or um, how they their life is, is structured. Um, I'm a suburbanite. I live outside of Toronto. Um, the town that I live in, everything is about, you know, people with kids. I'm single, I don't have children, I have a dog. Um, you know, I love my town. I love the fact that they do stuff for kids. I love, the, you know, the kids are gonna be the ones that are running the world when we're all old and need people to help take care of us. But um, I think it's important to to keep in mind all of the different um, people. So, so families with kids, elderly people, single people, you know, people whose kids are old enough now that maybe they're trying to escape for a date night um, and, and looking at how and what the facility will provide for all of those people um, and all of the, the different, you know, they're all looking for different things out of Community Hub and, and focusing on how the facility, once it's complete, um, may you know speak to or enrich their lives um and i think that the same is true like if you're talking like leslie was saying to to city council um i think it's important to to highlight how the facility will um, benefit 
all of these different groups, right? Because people who sit on city council, they're thinking about all their constituents and different councillors, depending on where in the city they, they represent, their constituents are made up of different demographics. Um, so I think making sure that you have a wide reach on, on the types of people and, and the, the types of lives that they may be leading and how they can all benefit from different aspects of the, of the project. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Dave, do you have any thoughts on the value proposition of this building that could be useful for the various stakeholders? I'm going to be very specific, Leslie, on this one. Um, if it were me and if I were TO Live, I would be focusing within sort of a 10 or 15 minute walk radius from your facility to all the multi unit residential buildings in the neighborhood and all those you know, sort of poor or thousands of potential patrons in their 600 square foot shoe boxes to suggest that this is really an extension of the amenity spaces within their own buildings. So as much as they may have a little gym to work out in, in within the building or a party room that they can rent occasionally for a birthday or for, for a, a celebration, this space literally that's in their backyard is I think the biggest attraction in terms of all the other things happening in that area, in the St. Lawrence Market and all these other components. Um, you know, this is an extension of their building. It's within walking distance. They can take their four-legged friends with them. They can bring family and friends and, and share this experience and then become future patrons of the arts by doing so. So I, I think it's powerful. And you have thousands of people um, living in, in that densified community that, that would see this, I think, is, is the best thing to happen to them. I love that. that I mean, I think... We hope that that's what they think <laughs> at the end. Um, Kara, do you have any thoughts on what you would say to the different stakeholders to help to build that value proposition? I mean, we've heard a lot from everyone else. I'm not sure I've got a lot to add. A lot of really great ideas. Thanks, Kara. Bettina, is there anything that you'd like to add? I guess I, from the stakeholder approach uh, for the artists, I think one of the things with the National Ballet Center, we were involved in a workshop with them and one of the things that stood out the most were how uh, the ballerinas themselves and the dance instructors and people felt that they were part of that process. And so I think it's great that you are really making an effort to involve the artists, letting them know that they matter, that their voices matter uh, and, and that they belong because they're going to be displaced while all of this is happening as well. So finding ways for them to continue to be involved and continue to feel like they matter. Uh, from the community se session, exactly yes to all those condo dwellers who are who are going to be your future patrons, uh, as hopefully will the, the whole you know Golden Horseshoe make it really easy for people to get there and feel like they're a part of it. Uh, I can tell you, I, li I live here, and every building around us is some awful new condo, which I will have nothing to do with. Whereas your building going up, I don't care. That's the next. Five, 10 years, there's going to be a ton of construction. I'm thrilled because I'll be a part of that, not just because of this, but but because it, it's part of my neighborhood and, and I will feel like I will belong. But I know that because I've heard this and everybody else in our neighborhood needs to feel that they are going to be a part of it. Yeah, it's going to be messy, but in the end, that result will not be another condo. It's going to be something you know that belongs to everybody. And from a donor's perspective, uh, you know, it, it's they are the thread I have written here. You know, you're the thread that will strengthen the quilt that is our city. We've gone through a lot of division. We've gone through a lot of heartache in this and a lot of loneliness. And art is how we can bring people together and donors can provide that thread to you know, pull us all together. Thank you so much, Latina. Um, I, I do think that there is a real community connection piece there that when we look at the mental health challenges that have come through this pandemic, um, having a cultural hub like this can be incredibly valuable um, on a very deep level for the whole family and for youth in particular. So I, I think, yeah, I think that wraps up our our discussion. We're, we're beyond our 2.30 time slot. Um, we could go back and talk about future proofing, but I think that would take us beyond our 3 p.m. deadline of, of logging off of the system. So I wanted to, I think we can stop there. Um, unless, Leslie, do you have any questions that you want to pose to the, the group while you have us here? 
I I think I'm I think I'm good. Um, yeah, I I don't know. Are we are we wrapping up entirely? Well, I'll 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 just be the first one to thank everyone then for your time, your expertise, your enthusiasm. Um, on behalf of uh, TO Live and my partners at Creatio, I can't tell you how important these conversations are at this juncture and will, as I said, um, continue to be important. So thank you, thank you. And um, I hope that um, I hope that the where our understanding of success is meets yours. <laughs> Well, I think we're all very excited to be a part of this this process with you, Leslie. We really appreciate the chance to share our thoughts and don't want to speak on behalf of the collaborators, but I do believe that's the energy that's come across here today. And I, I want to take a moment to make sure that there, if there's any questions from our student audience or anyone around the table, that they have a moment to, to share those questions. You can either chat them or, or take yourself off, off mute and, and let us know what your thoughts are. And we're going to be comfortable with the silence for a moment. Do, 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 do. I'm just seeing the Jeopardy song. So um, you can see Bettina swaying to it because. I think that means that we have there are no questions coming to us at this time, which means it's been a very fulsome discussion is what I like to take away from it. Um, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for participating and, and uh, yeah, really appreciate this great discussion today. Sure, I'll log everybody off. I'll just remind students, uh, we've got two sessions tomorrow. Well, we've a one mini session and two learning sessions and then the rest is up to you your team presentations you've now seen how we do it so you can see <laughs> we have no idea we're trying the best we can and uh and hopefully some some ideas have come and, and you, there are no wrong or right answers right it, it's what comes from the heart of your team is what leslie and her team would like to hear from you because your voices are important and and leslie i think I, can, I just want to thank you and thank the City of Toronto team, you know, Transform TO, your team as well for being here today, because it's it's such a it's such an unusual and amazing experience to be able to see people dreaming and realizing, uh, you know, actual projects, what real issues that come up, and and of course we all want the best building, the best possible way, and and tough decisions have to be made and, and we're, we admire and we appreciate so much that you guys have uh, opened up this window, like Brianne was saying, that you have opened up this window for the students to allow them to see how this process takes place. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone, take care. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Okay, we're going to turn it off.